Are we on? There we are. And we're off and running. Hello and welcome to the Wednesday edition of the Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Alstrand. I'm in for Todd again this week. Vanessa Vanden is not feeling well today and is off. So Blake Priddle is behind the glass. So make sure you say hi to Blake when you call in later today. Now, out of the interest of time, uh, with our first guest, I'm going to dispense with our regular monologue this morning. But a reminder that the open hour moves from hour uh, to hour three today because of house calls with Dr. John Gillis, which, of course, happens at 11, right after the 11 o'clock news in hour number two. Well, our first guest is one of a few that, if any, can say that they served in the Navy, spent time at space, and served in the federal cabinet under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. That kind of sounds like a Jeopardy question, doesn't it? Well, if you answered, who is Mark Garneau, you're right. Please welcome to the uh, program the aforementioned Mark Garneau. Mark, welcome. Good morning. Good to be with you. I'm glad you had a few minutes for us today. Um, let's start back in the early days. Uh, as a young officer in the Royal Canadian Navy back in the 70s, did you ever think that you'd go to space or sit in a cabinet route in Ottawa as a Minister of the Crown? Uh, certainly not. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, I was dreaming of one thing, which was to join the Navy, and that's what I did. And I served for a number of years in Halifax, and uh, two of my children were born there, and I thought I would have a full Navy career. But uh, life sometimes uh, is full of surprises. Have you uh, kept up, up on what's going on in the Navy? Have, have you seen uh, a big change since your time in? Yes, I've, I, it's a lifelong interest for me. I've always followed it, and uh, you know, I'm certainly uh, looking at uh, how the new ships are being built. Um, I wish our Navy was bigger. Um, I think it's important. Uh, it fulfills such an important role, and I try to keep up with it, yeah. Mark Arnault is our guest. Mark, uh, let's talk about that decision from, to leave the Navy and, and pursue this, this career in space. What was that decision like, and, and what was the selection process like? To get, to, to get selected down at NASA? So it happened when I saw an ad in the paper. Uh, that's how it was advertised back in 1983, uh, right across the country. Uh, NASA wanted to thank Canada for designing and building the, the famous robotic arm, the Canada arm, and said, we'd like to invite a couple of Canadians to, uh, to become astronauts and to fly. And so Canada had a competition. I saw the ad in the paper in the summer of 83. I said, wow. Uh, even though I was in the Navy and I loved the Navy, uh, this opportunity perhaps to be out on this new frontier of space was just too too strong and too attractive for me to resist it. And although I didn't think I would be chosen, I sent in my application and uh, lo and behold, six months later, I was one of the fortunate first six Canadian astronauts. What was the selection process like? Was it uh, Was it interviews? Was it physical? Was it everything of the above? It was everything. It went on for six months in several stages. We started off uh, 4,300, and it was whittled down to uh, the final week before the selection. There were 19 of us left, and uh, they looked at us with a fine-tooth comb and uh, lots of interviews, speeches, uh, observing us, looking at our backgrounds, uh, all those things. And uh, and then uh, on the 3rd of December said, stand by your phones, we'll phone you and let you know whether you made it or not. And uh, October the 4th or 5th, like, uh, you know, more than a year ago, we'll say, uh, you managed to uh, to live that dream and, and strapped yourself on top of an exploding bomb and ended up in space. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way to put it, yes, for sure. It is. Uh, it does unleash 7 million pounds of thrust because it's got to take you from, uh, from a standstill to 28,000 kilometers an hour. So, uh, yeah, you need a lot of power to do that. And, uh, Yes, it was a dream come true for me, and it's uh, something that's sort of seared into my brain uh, for the rest of my days. Mark, what do you remember most? I imagine there were all kinds of those wow moments while you were up there. What's the, what's the one that kind of stands above the rest? Oh, uh, without a doubt, uh, the first time I floated out of my seat and went over and looked out the window and uh, consciously realized that I wasn't looking at a, a picture or a video or dreaming. I was actually up in space, and we were orbiting Earth, and I could see Earth down below. I was trying to recognize where we were. We, were, we, were, we launched from the Kennedy Space Center, but by the time I looked out the window, we were already over Europe, and uh, that that image uh, of Earth the first time I saw it and the curvature of the Earth and uh, the blackness of space above it, uh, that is what is uh, the most memorable for me. You must get asked this question a million times, but I'm going to ask it. I'll be a million and one. What, what's, it, what's that experience like to be 
to that weightless experience to, to be able to float around? Well, it, uh, I, I, I am often asked that, particularly by kids, because, uh, and, and kids, of course, when they're young, we all know they have lots of imagination, and uh, everything is possible, and uh, they're not sort of, uh, uh, they're not bound by the laws of physics when they're children, and, um, and uh, as we grow up, we, we're kind of told that, well, some things are possible and some things are not possible, but guess what? When you go into space, uh, you get the chance to float, and it kind of brings back your childhood in you. And uh, that's why astronauts, when they get up there, have big grins on their faces. Uh, they're, they're kind of reliving things that they might have dreamt of when they were kids. It's, a, it's kind of magical. Mark Arno has a new book coming out. It's called The Most Extraordinary Ride, Space Politics and the Pursuit of the Canadian Dream. Once you're back on terra firma, Mark, uh, how does one's thinking go from, from space exploration and weightlessness and all of the things that you did uh, above the planet to public service and and running for elected office? Well, it's a big transition, that's for sure. Um, and I often tell people that when I was an astronaut, I was a, uh, everybody liked me. Uh, when I decided to become a politician, of course, another way to serve your country, uh, I realized at that point that uh, Canadians would, would be expressing themselves, uh, not only my constituents uh, in Montreal, but uh, all Canadians, and, and uh, telling me what they agreed with and what they disagreed with. And so you have to be prepared for the fact that uh, the life of a politician is not necessarily uh, just filled with people telling you uh, that they're happy with what you're doing. Um, and, and that's good. That's good. We live in a democracy. And so I had to sort of grow a little bit of a thicker skin uh, when I first became a politician. But at the same time, I didn't want to grow it so thick that I lost contact with people. Like many that get into public, like Mark, your first experience uh, with an election was an unsuccessful one. You lost in 06. Yes, I did. Uh, the, the Liberals had been in, in uh, government for almost 12 years under Chrétien and then Martin, and uh, Canadians wanted to change. And so um, it was perhaps what you'd call bad timing on my part. But uh, I had been invited by the Liberal Party to run. I ran. Uh, I lost uh, convincingly, although I still had a respectable showing. But it planted the seed for me, and I decided, well, um, you know, I'm not going to give up. Uh, maybe uh, things will be better next time. And two years later, there was another election, and uh, this time I got in. And uh, after that election, we're, uh, we're put into, into cabinet as a minister of the crown for industry, space, and, uh, and uh, industry and space. And obviously, that's a great fit for you, given that you're, we're in space. Yeah, it was a logical fit and one that I was very happy to be in. Now, I was in opposition at that time. I was yep. a critic for it, and uh, we, uh, we spent seven years in opposition. Uh, these were during the Harper years, and it wasn't until 2015 that uh, Canadians once again decided that they'd uh, like to uh, do a switch uh, and uh, elected uh, the Liberal Party under, uh, under Justin Trudeau. Before that, though, uh, there were some leadership contests as, as the Liberal Party tried to figure out the direction it was going in. And a couple of those leadership contests, uh, one in particular, you threw your hat into the ring to, to go up against Justin Trudeau uh, for the leadership. Yes, I did. Um, you know, after the 2011 election, which we lost very badly, we were reduced to being the third party. and We only had 34 seats. Well, we had to have a, a leadership uh, race. And uh, I had not initially thought of, uh, of putting my hat in the ring, but uh, some people came up to me and said, Mark, you should run. And, um, and they persuaded me uh, enough to, 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 to do that, and uh, I enjoyed the experience. Uh, but, uh, I mean, Justin Trudeau won quite convincingly, uh, but uh, I enjoyed that experience because it took me not only – uh, to my riding, but across the entire country during a five-month period. I got to know Canada better and, and Canadians, and, and there are different views uh, across the, the country uh, about how things should be done. So it was still a very valuable experience, and, uh, and uh, after that, uh, uh, you know, we all, we all got together because there were nine candidates for the leadership, and uh, we're, uh, we're solidly behind Justin Trudeau. Then uh, transport minister, that portfolio handed to you, Mark, and uh, and one of the uh, the legacy pieces of your time in that portfolio was the passenger bill of rights, and we just saw this past week a, a Supreme Court decision affirming some of the things that were laid out in that legislation. Tell me about the passenger bill of rights and and how important it was you to get 
was to you to get that piece of legislation into law? Well, it was very important. Uh, I wasn't the first to propose it. Um, one of my liberal colleagues, uh, while we were in opposition, had first proposed it, and uh, I thought it was a good idea. And then when I became the transport minister, I decided that we should uh, have in Canada a passenger bill of rights. And, uh, and you know, it, it what we initially put together wasn't perfect. It's, you know, it's it's hard to get the proper balance so that Passengers do have rights and airlines are accountable when um, delays or cancellations occur that are within the power of the airlines uh, to to control. And uh, I think it's come a long way and I was certainly very happy. It's you know, I think there will probably be some some more iterations, but I think it's come a long way. And I was delighted that the Supreme Court affirmed the fact that, uh, yes, Canadians are entitled to certain rights when they uh, when they pay for a, a, a flight. Then, uh, then COVID hit, and you were transport minister during COVID times, also working with uh, the health minister at the time, Patty Haidu, when all of the world changed. Tell me about your time in cabinet during COVID and, and what that experience was like. It was a very busy time. Uh, I was not only minister of transport, but I was on uh, the committee that was uh, focused on COVID. And as Canadians will remember, when it started off in 2020, um, the whole world uh, was caught by surprise. We didn't know uh, how to deal with it because our only previous pandemic was 100 years before that, uh, the Spanish uh, pan- uh, flu uh, pandemic in 1918. So um, the health, uh, the head of health, uh, Teresa Tam, was saying, uh, all I can tell you right now is that uh, it's transmitted by people coughing or breathing and droplets can can go up to two meters and so people need to wear masks and we need to protect ourselves but we had no vaccines um, against this and people were dying Uh, a lot of people were dying in Quebec where I lived uh, particularly in seniors residences people were dying and we didn't quite have a we didn't have a grasp on it and uh, nor did any other country for that matter and I think, you know, uh, in the year that we dealt with it, I think that um, that we put measures in place. I think we did a, a reasonably jo- a good job in Canada. We, we ordered a lot of masks. Uh, we ordered a lot of the promising vaccines. Uh, we ordered a lot of ventilators because hospitals needed ventilators uh, for, for, for sick people. And uh, a year later, and this is, I think, a scientific uh, great achievement, uh, the first uh, so-called mRNA vaccine started to come out. And, uh, and Canadians uh, had some supplies by December of, uh, of, uh, of 2020, and we started to, uh, to administer them. And from a transport point of view, I had to put in place measures because when people get an aircraft, uh, they're all bunched together, and when people get on trains, the same thing can happen. And even though people decided to stay at home most of the time, some people were still flying. So we had to put in safety measures to make sure that we weren't transmitting it uh, when people got on airplanes and, and trains. Mark, we've only got about 45 seconds left. I know you're a busy busy guy today with this book launch and, and such, but I, I'd like to ask the question, Do you, you know, with the benefit of, of hindsight, you know, being 2020, do you think that we got the got it right when we we handled the way we handled COVID? When I look at the rest of the world, I think we did a good job compared to to many others, and uh, that's one of the things that uh, that I think our government uh, can be proud of. Mark Gardon, I appreciate the time. The book is a most extraordinary ride: space politics and the pursuit of the Canadian dream, coming to a bookshelf near you. Thanks for your time, sir. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. That is Mark Garneau, former Navy man, former astronaut, and former Liberal cabinet minister. We need to stop down, take our first break here on the Todd Vino Show. When we come back, we're keeping our eye on Milton as it continues to churn towards Florida. Our weather specialist, Alistair Alders, will be your guest with the very latest on the storm. You're listening to the Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Alstrand. We're back in minutes. Welcome back to the Tavino Show. Dan Olstrand along with you. 
That uh, Mark Garneau interview was supposed to take 30 minutes, and I have a whole bunch of other questions I wanted to get to, but unfortunately, Mr. Garneau is a busy man and uh, and uh, could only give us 15, so maybe we'll try, once the book gets out and, and uh, into circulation, we'll try and get him back to, to answer a few more questions, uh, given that uh, he spent a lot of time here in Halifax in the Navy and, uh, and uh, has a little special place in his heart for our community. Speaking of community, there's a community that is the state of Florida that is uh, on pins and needles this morning as we watch the very latest storm that is working its way towards the west coast of Florida and the Tampa area move uh, in tonight, uh, maybe a little bit later than first thought. So when it comes to the weather, we go to we go to our expert, and he's on the line with us. Please welcome to the show weather specialist Alistair Alders. Alistair, how are you? I'm good, Dan. How are you? Good. Uh, as I understand it, the very latest uh, on this storm is now Milton is a Category 4 hurricane, correct? Correct. I mean, it's only two kilometers per hour away from being Category 5, so I mean, it's it's a very high-end Category 4 hurricane, but yes, it has weakened somewhat back into that uh, Category 4 strength and it's expected to make landfall as a category four hurricane uh like you said a bit later than for first forecast uh, that landfall expected uh, near sarasota tonight uh, later tonight so just to put everybody's kind of fear at rest because you know we've been talking about this storm for some time your opinion is there any chance that milton can track and hit atlantic canada or influence our weather in any way no, I no. I mean, Milton will cross over Florida, and as it moves back into the Atlantic, it's going to weaken, become post-tropical, and dissipate over the Atlantic. So, I mean, there's no worry there. And plus, the, the general steering flow of the atmosphere would not really allow it to track into the region. We have this uh, upper-level low that's going to be spinning overhead, you know, through the end of the week and this weekend with a ridge to the west of it. So that's just putting the steering winds, you know, uh, more west to east and south of our region. So, uh, no, it's it's no risk of coming towards Atlantic Canada, and it's going to be dissipating, you know, before it would even have a chance of making its way here. So certainly that is good news for us because obviously, you know, anytime there's a hurricane near Florida or anywhere near the east coast of the U.S., you know, people do get a little bit worried because obviously a lot of the times uh, those storms can track up the East coast, but this is a very unique uh, situation. We don't see, where the, sorry, we, we don't see these storms track West to East often, do we? Not, no, not often. I mean, a lot of the times these, uh, they start as, you know, these disturbances that come off of Florida and then they, or sometimes, you know, of course they start in the, in the Caribbean or the Gulf, but they more often track, uh, you know, in a bit of a south to north direction. I mean, obviously they do start to curve towards the north and east as they move into our region, just with how the the winds flow in the in the jet stream. But you know, it's not too often that we see a storm make landfall approaching, you know, in a west to east direction like like what is going to happen with Milton in Florida. What's the latest guidance on on Florida? When do you suspect landfall, and what kind of impact uh, can they expect there? So they're already starting to feel the impacts now, at least in the form of rain. There's quite a bit of rain falling over uh, places like Cape Coral, Cape Coral, Sarasota, Tampa, uh, Orlando, right up towards Jacksonville. Uh, the wind, not as big of a concern yet, but winds are going to ramp up throughout the day today and tonight. That landfall is expected, looks like uh, later tonight, likely after midnight. Uh, as I mentioned, a Category 4 hurricane. So, I mean, there's wow. going to be very strong winds, you know, certainly peaking in the range of 130 to 150 kilometers per hour near the center of that storm, which will be near Sarasota or Tampa. Uh, but certainly guidance is indicating we could see winds gusting near 170 or 180 at their peak, if not a bit higher, especially along the coast. So, I mean, very intense winds, you know, around the center, but, you know, hurricane and tropical storm force winds for a good portion of Florida. And then, of course, we have the rainfall, which is going to be quite intense. There's a risk of flash flooding near and north of Tampa and Orlando. Some areas are going to see, you know, three to 400 plus millimeters of rain. 
as uh, Milton moves over Florida. And then, of course, there's the storm surge, which, I mean, you know, the wind is, you know, a big factor. So is the flash flooding from the rain. But the storm surge is going to be a big deal, and it could be devastating for parts of the west coast of Florida. I mean, storm surge is possible, you know, from the Big Bend right down to the Keys. But, you know, we're focusing in on places like Tampa Bay and Charlotte Harbor and Sarasota, where we could be looking at storm surges of, 8 to 12 feet, possibly up to 15 feet. I mean, this is, you know, wow. three to four and a half, five meter storm surges that will be coming ashore tonight. I mean, it's it's a very serious storm. It's a very serious threat. And, you know, I think especially here in Atlantic Canada, we all know hurricanes have, you know, waves and surges. I think for us, we often think of the aspect of, you know, the rain and the wind. I mean, the... The, the storm surges uh, themselves, you know, arguably the most dangerous part of a hurricane. And I mean, extremely deadly uh, and very devastating. I mean, there's likely going to be, uh, you know, devastating impacts along the west coast of Florida tonight. Alistair, maybe to put in perspective for, for some of us here who have no way to sort of comprehend what a, what a Category 4 storm uh, coming ashore would look like. How does this storm relate to hurricanes that we're familiar with here, like like Juan or Dorian or Fiona? So, I mean, obviously with storms like uh, Fiona and Dorian, they became post-tropical before uh, making landfall. So, you know, there was a bit of a structural difference. Uh, Juan was still a f- intact hurricane when it made landfall here. I mean... I would say the big differences, you know, between, say, Milton and those storms would be, you know, the strength. Uh, those storms were, I I'm, I apologize, I can't remember off the top of my head if Dorian was, I think it might have been a low-end, you know, Category 2 strength winds. I can't recall off the top it of my really head. It was really close. I apologize. No, yeah, it was it really, was, really close. It was really close. I mean, Fiona was a low-end Cat 2, and I believe, uh, you know, one ended up having, you know, Uh, category two wins as well i mean we're talking about you know category four you know it's you know very serious and i mean this storm too is going to be growing in size which we did see with storms like uh fiona and dorian when they made landfall here and it expanded its size the wind field grew and the impacts spread out farther uh than you know just confined to a small hurricane. Uh, Milton's also going to be expanding in size, so those impacts are going to be more widespread across Florida rather than contained to just uh, one area. Uh, But certainly, you know, the winds are much stronger. The rain is much heavier, although we've had had significant rain from uh, past tropical systems in our region. Um, I think, obviously, uh, with Fiona, we did have, you know, some devastating storm surges in parts of eastern Nova Scotia and certainly southwestern Newfoundland and PEI, eastern New Brunswick. But, I mean, uh, certainly nothing near the magnitude of what the west coast of Florida will be experiencing tonight. Alistair, once uh, once Milton makes landfall and moves across the landmass, it's going to lose a little bit of steam. Is there any chance that once it gets back into the Atlantic Ocean that it'll it'll re-energize and gain strength or... Is this is it going to peter out as it moves from west to east? Looks like it's going to uh, diminish, and I mean uh, something that is good. It's just too bad it wasn't happening sooner. Is it's going to be entering a more unfavorable air mass because there's going to be more uh, wind shear to help tear the storm apart and weaken it. And if only we could have it just a bit sooner. Um, because, I mean, obviously for the people in Florida, this is going to be a significant hurricane, um, but that's going to help weaken it. And, yeah, all signs are that this will continue to weaken, you know, well below hurricane strength as we move uh, into and through Friday and uh, the system becomes post-tropical. So no signs of it re-energizing over the Atlantic, thankfully, um, because uh, Florida will have to deal with a lot and we don't want it to go anywhere else. Right, absolutely. Alistair, appreciate the time. Thank you, Dan. Have a great day. That is our weather specialist, Alistair Alders. You can hear him in the morning and afternoon now during the morning drive and the afternoon drive for your latest weather. We need to stop down. Shelly's going to update us on what's going on in the world. And when we come back, the show continues. A conversation with a candidate for District 8. You are listening to The Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Alstrand. We're back in minutes.
Welcome back. Dan Olsen along with you here on a Wednesday morning as we roll along through the first hour of the program. As you well know, we've been spending some time over the last, oh goodness, four or five weeks having conversations with those that have uh, have made the effort to, to, to throw their hats into the ring and, and uh, take the for some, a gigantic step and and uh, and working their way into public life. And we're going to continue to do that right through up until uh, Election Day, which is, of course, the 19th, which isn't that far away. And if you haven't, or, or, or uh, for whatever reason, haven't heard, the uh, electronic voting is open. The, the telephone voting is open. The online voting is open. So if you've already made your decision and you're ready to go, then uh, by all means, do it, get it done, but just... Do it. Sounds like a Nike commercial, doesn't it? Anyway, uh, we're, as I mentioned, we're going to continue our conversation uh, with uh, uh, with candidates, and we're very pleased to welcome in uh, to the program uh, District 8 candidates. I've been practicing this. Evania Dexter, did I get close? Excellent, Excellent job. Nailed it. <laughs> See? And and uh, we're, we're kidding because we, I have a weird last name too, and and she's actually got it on all of her on her signs and stuff. I was at I was at the intersection of uh, of Kempt Road and and Lady Ham and, and there's a sign there. And I was practicing it yesterday <laughs> when I was on my way home. Anyway, uh, I appreciate you stopping by and and uh, and spending some time with us today. And I've asked every person that sat in that chair this this first question, and and I'll ask you the same. Why did you decide that now was the time for uh, for you to enter public life and run for office? Uh, thanks for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, I I decided to to run uh, first because a couple people asked me if I'd be willing to, um, and to be honest, it was a bit of a surprise. And I uh, thought about it, spoke with a bunch of counselors, uh, l- really looked into it because I didn't want to get into something that I wasn't uh, going to do a great job at. Um, I ran a business in the North End, and I closed it last year. And it was this is also my way of giving back to the community that supported my business for so many years. You and I were chatting before we went uh, on the air uh, about uh, you know being out knocking on doors and 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 such. And you said you've been doing that since like August. Uh, what has the response been to a your candidacy? But b what are, are some of the some of the issues that uh, that are coming to the forefront when you talk to people on their doorsteps? Uh, yes, I'm. I'm getting a really great response when I go, um, uh, especially people who I, I didn't know they lived there, and I show up, and I actually um, knew them already. So it's been it's been really positive. Um, I'd say initially it started with the the top issues uh, that are going on about housing and transit and um, uh, homelessness. Uh, but what I really found as I was going along is that people really want a livable city. And the everyday ins and outs of their lives is what um, what they feel they have some control over, or that I could have some control over, and that I could help them with. What what kind of issues are, are we talking about here? Like we we obviously everybody's talking about housing and and transit and transportation, but what else are you hearing on the on the doorstep? Uh, yes, it's uh it's basically about um, you know their their sidewalks being cleared, them being able to get to work on time through the transit. Um, the fact that there's an increased rut problem in the North End. Um, Which nobody likes to talk about. Nobody likes to talk about it. And I was actually quite surprised. I mean, I knew Port City, we have rats, but yeah. um, I believe it's, it's it's gotten worse. And by speak, it's come up quite a few times on the doorsteps, especially in the further North End. Um, and yeah, these are things that we we can do in a short term while we're working on the long term large problems. Yeah, uh, Development in the North End, I mean... We just have to look out our windows here, uh, and it's 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 mind blowing. If I look back at pictures from, you know, five or six years ago, and 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 the just the landscape has changed here. What are people telling you about the amount of development happening in the North End and the kind of development that's happening here? Yeah, I think overall people are uh, for densifying, uh, you know, the North End. Um, however, they want it done in a thoughtful and strategic way. Um, not being able to move around on foot because the sidewalks have been taking over. Um, Again, this is back to everyday living. Um, They understand the large problems um, and the benefits of development, yet um, if they can't get to work or are struggling to walk on the sidewalk. um, Also, mixed, mixed, uh, mixed types and sizes of development. We want some of that middle housing, um, which could also be more affordable, but also uh, play in with the uh, culture and 
uh, the history of our city as well. A lot of longtime residents of the North End I have conversations with, you know, have, I wouldn't say a lot of concern, but maybe some concern about the, the way that, that like changes like on Agricola Street have changed and, and uh, on uh, uh, um, Gottagen Street have changed. What are you hearing? Are people happy with some of the, and I'm going to quotes around this because the word kind of bothers me, but the, the gentrification of, of those traditional areas. Uh, yes, I think I think that's a concern uh, for sure. Uh, people don't want everybody either was who was born here or moved here was for a specific reason, and we're changing quite rapidly from that. Um, but I think if we can actually tie the two in together and maintain some of that culture, um, make the landscape of it uh, not change too too differently, so that all we have is rows and rows of high rises, I think people will be pleased and. I, I've also found that, uh, you know, there is a bit of a, a short memory afterwards of some buildings. They're gone and they're like, what was there again? Yeah, you know, because right? it's changed so quickly. Um, but uh, but overall, I think our, the, the consensus is that we need we need some more people on the peninsula. Yeah. Uh, homelessness and affordability, obviously, are, are uh, big concerns, not just in this district, but districts right across the HRM. What are What are your thoughts on the way that that regional council has handled the the homelessness issue with with their designated encampments. Uh, is that the right approach, or can we do better? Yeah, I think I think they were in a tough spot, and it seemed to me that uh, their decision was made because there didn't seem to be any other decisions being made. Um, I this is a problem that's uh, didn't happen overnight. And it's well beyond the scope of one council, one government, and or the social services that provide there. Um, and we must work together to be able to to ha- come up with a solution and and find people a roof over their heads as soon as possible. Active transportation is a hot button on this show. It sure is. <laughs> it, it's, it, it certainly gets a lot of attention, and and I think that that is is telling because you know most people and Todd will say many times and has been said many times that that people that are happy don't call the 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 open hour to to say hey we're happy about this but <laughs> what are your thoughts on on active transportation on the on the the bike lanes and uh, and the way that the city's rolling those out Yeah I I've recently looked over the integrated mobility plan and I f- I feel it's a step in the right direction um my my focus personally would be on transit uh before transit and making the city walkable and livable um, bike lanes are also a necessary part. We've already started. I'd like to see a continuous route finished uh, so people can actually see what the plan is because uh, right now people are a little confused by how it's being rolled out. Uh, but transit is by far uh, vital to the growth of our city and uh, to keep that infrastructure going as we're growing. Just about at a time, uh, obviously one of the, the, the talking points in, in the North End is is what to do with that Bloomfield site. What, what are people telling you about Bloomfield and what, what is your vision for that, uh, that old school? Yes, I, I hear every day about Bloomfield. Um, and my, uh, my business was right across the street from it for 18 years. So firsthand, I've been looking at it every day. <laughs> um, I, think, I think people are very frustrated that it sat empty for so long. Um, I don't think any large piece of land should sit as long as it does without any plan uh, to move ahead. Um, People would like to see um, a a mixture of both housing, green space, services. We need, we can't keep taking services away as we're growing. Um, So I'd like to see that um, as well as uh, just in the North End, uh, uh, Centennial Pool and uh, Needham Pool also have to be uh, refurbished or saved and I know one of them is on, you know, slated to be uh, uh, redone, rebuilt, uh, but it's not soon enough. And uh, we can't, you know, in taking away Centennial Pool and other things like this, it's, it's what not What would the community do. think if we took Centennial Pool away? Well, I mean, that, uh, would, that I'm hearing, would be a, people are, right? People need it. it it's a service for all ages, um, all the pools, all the community rec centers. Um, we, need, we need more, actually. We're bursting at the seams up at Needham Rec Center. Just about out of time, Evania. Evania. I uh, got it. Uh, <laughs> how do we find out more about you? Um, you can look on my website, eviania.dexter.ca. Mm-hmm. And I'm also on Facebook and Instagram under eviania.dexter, District 8. Got it. Appreciate the time. Best of luck in the upcoming election and uh, keep knocking on doors. Great. Thank you so much.
We need to stop down and take another break, but when we come back, uh, the Halifax Mooseheads, a rare Wednesday game this week. We're going to queue up the game tonight with play-by-play announcer Gareth McDonald. When we come back, you're listening to the Tavino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand. We're back in minutes. Thanks. Welcome back. Dan Alstrain along with you here on a Wednesday. It's weird that we're going to be talking about Moosehead Hockey on a Wednesday. Just it, these days where we have these midweek games are, are, are not as, as, um, as frequent as they used to be and uh, still kind of throws me off. My whole brain when I start talking about Moosehead Hockey tonight feels like it's Friday. So maybe I'll just take a long weekend. What do you think? Uh, many of you might be happy that I did that. Anyway, welcome to the program, our play-by-play announcer right here on 95.7 News Radio. He is Gareth McDonald. Gareth, how are you? I'm good, Dan. I'm great. Um, and don't sell yourself short. You're great, too. Oh, listen People to you. enjoy you. Wow, you know? look at He's just, he's here. I should just talk to Gareth every day just to pump up my ego. Well, it sounds like you need a little pick me up here. You're beating yourself up. Well, you know, a little bit of coffee might help that, right? I agree. I agree. Gareth, uh, Three weeks ago, if you and I would have been sitting in this studio, we would have been saying, look, Halifax Mooseheads have, like, what, six or seven or eight 16-year-old players on it. We gave away a lot of goals uh, by via trade this year. Uh, we could be, in, and I know nobody wants to talk about the word, but we could be in the midst of a rebuild, and uh, it may be a long season for fans in Moose country. Uh, fast forward three weeks, Halifax Mooseheads are sitting atop the Maritimes division, uh, with uh, five wins and ten points, and uh, are kind of shaking everybody in their boots at this point. Yeah, it's uh, it has been a surprising start. That's that's for sure. I, you know, talking with some other coaches around the league, that's how that's how they describe it. You know, this has been uh, it's been a real good story here in Halifax. It is still early days, as we know. We're just a few weeks in. Uh, I think last year. The Valdor Forer, I think they rattled off about seven straight to begin the year, and then the, the wheels really fell off for them in the winter. So uh, you never want to read too, too much in to, uh, to these first few weeks. But I, I think what we, what we can tell right now, uh, what has been very evident through, uh, through almost, uh, yeah, almost a month of the season right now, um, you can look, yeah, I mean, it was, it was evident back during training camp as well. There's... There's just a lot of belief and uh, a lot of buy-in, a lot of commitment from this group. The, the the games we've seen from them so far, they have been full 60-minute efforts. Just so much consistency, as, as you mentioned. I mean, they may not want to use the word rebuild, but I would say within the fan base, that's exactly what they were expecting this year, fans in Halifax. When it comes to junior hockey, very educated on it. and They realize, you know, with the, the, with the cycle of junior hockey, you're – you're going to have a few years where you go for it, and then there's going to be the lean years afterwards. I, I think what's just been so impressive here is just watching this really young team buy into the program that Andrew Lord is selling and uh, just uh, bring in the work boots each and every game. It's, uh, it really has been uh, a real joy to watch, to watch these first few weeks of the season and the, the, the compete level for the Mooseheads. Gareth, you, you follow this team closer than most do. I mean, you travel with them and, and so on and so forth. What has what the feeling like been on the bus, in the in the hallways, in the locker rooms with, with the new coach, with Andrew Lord behind the bench? Is it a, is it a completely different feel this year? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, I would say it's a, a, a different feel for sure. I mean, it, it, you know, it's obviously you do have a, a new coach there. There's a lot of new personnel uh, when it comes to the, the, the players. You, you kind of mentioned it earlier. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of new blood in this organization. You know, you can look back at the draft in Moncton in June, three picks in the first three rounds for the Mooseheads. And, uh, you know, all three of those guys have, have cracked the lineup and Danny Walters, Kalen Blake, uh, Emilio Santini. So three 16 year olds right there. They got six 17 year olds in the lineup. There's, there's just, there's a lot of fresh blood. And then you can take Sean Carrier coming over from, from Moncton and the, the trade that sent overager Marcus Vitacek there back in uh, at the draft last June. And uh, Sean Carrier, he was a, a guy that came into the league, highly touted sixth overall pick in last year's draft. 
was kind of buried in a, in a depth role on that Moncton roster. It was an older Moncton roster last year. He was on the fourth line for most of the season. He only finished with uh, about 11 points. And obviously uh, that was a learning experience for him. He, he didn't have the year that he would have liked and probably wasn't playing the role he would have liked either. But uh, he's a guy that's you know, kind of come into a new organization here. He's been a dog and a bone out there and uh, comes into you know this, this game tonight leading the team and scoring one of the top scorers in the queue and uh, has just really kind of embraced the identity that this team's looking for, just tenacious, hardworking, and uh, those full, consistent 60-minute efforts. And uh, guys like Sean Carey, new to the organization, like I said, they, they bought right into that message. My, uh, my humble opinion, uh, I've been watching, obviously, uh, not as close as you, but I've been watching it, and, and I've been impressed with the emergence of Antoine Fontaine this year. Uh, is having a heck of a start to the season. Yeah, he's been he's been a great story, and uh, I think you know if you you were to ask around in in that Moosehead dressing room, this this guy he's just he's incredibly well liked, just a a great guy off the ice, and uh, another one of those guys you know like Sean Carrier, a guy that exhibited so much potential back in the Quebec U18 league. Um, he was on a real talented uh, Magog roster uh, back in. I guess it would be 2022. His team lost in the finals at at, uh, at Nationals. And he, he was probably in more of a depth role, similar to what he played last year. But then the next year it came out and ended up piling up. I think it was 55-plus points. He led the that Quebec U18 league in scoring and then made the moose heads last year. But, again, was kind of back into one of those depth roles. So it was a learning experience for him, embracing uh, – that fourth line checking role and you know he only finished the year i think he had three assists in 54 games and right now again coming into tonight he's second on this team in scoring so he's uh, he's been another terrific story and uh yeah really happy for antoine fontaine and the start that he's had so far we uh we had our home opener this past weekend uh, a split uh, a tough Ramuski squad uh, coming in uh, on uh, um on sunday and uh and uh, some concern on the bench as as the captain Brady uh, was was taken out of the game, have you heard anything about Schultz? Is he okay? Yeah, nothing official uh, just yet from the team. I, I mean, it, it definitely didn't look great. It was, uh, uh, I mean, the whole thing was was unfortunate. Uh, Matthew Catafor making his return to, to Halifax, uh, obviously a popular guy in the fan base, and I can tell you, he was a. He was a real popular guy in that dressing room, and and those two players they came into the league at the at the same time off the ice, pretty much inseparable. Those those are uh, real close close buddies, and uh, you know talking to both of them before the game, they were looking forward to to kind of going at it out there. Two two of the hardest hardest checkers I would say on the Mooseheads team last year, and Brady Schultz, one of the best uh, hitters open ice hitters in the league. He he did take a bit of uh I would say it was it was a tough shot from, from Matthew Catafor. Bit of a blind side hit. Wasn't a big fan of it. Um again, I, I'm not sure there was a ton of malicious intent there, but the outcome uh it, it didn't look great. Uh, Brady Schultz is just we mentioned it at the time during that broadcast the other day. He's, he's been so durable since he came in. I think he's only missed two games since uh coming into the league back in twenty twenty one. He was a Healthy scratch a few games into his rookie year, and then last year had a suspension that uh, kept him out of the game. But other than that, he's he's a guy that um, yeah, he's a, he's a warrior. He, does, he doesn't miss uh, doesn't miss too many shifts for sure. And tough to see him go out. So uh, yeah, I'm sure there's uh, a lot of evaluation going on with with his status. But uh, yeah, nothing official yet from the team. But like I said, didn't didn't look uh, didn't look great. On the road tonight in Bathurst to take on the T10. What can we expect from uh, from them this year? Yeah, I mean, this Bathurst team, obviously, uh, I think the fans here in Halifax don't need any reminders about how the playoffs went last year. Um, I think a lot of people that maybe didn't follow the league quite uh, quite as closely, um, you know, as, uh, as some diehards, so you, you, you might be, may have been a little surprised, I'd say, with the outcome. I, I think in the second half of the year, last year, though, Bathurst really had the Mooseheads number, and, uh, you know, it ends up in a in a four-game sweep. So I would say for the guys that are returning to the Mooseheads this year, there might be a little extra riding on this. They might feel they have something to prove. Uh, it's going to be two very hard-working teams going up against one another. Gordy Dwyer 
Uh, like Andrew Lord, has been getting a lot out of his team. Um, they, too, uh, compete for a full 60, and they've got some uh, exciting young talent there. So this should be a pretty pretty good matchup. A couple of young, hardworking teams going head-to-head. And this is the, the first half of a home-and-home, home, right? Yeah, they're back in action at the Scotiabank Center on Friday. They'll, uh, they'll face off again. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how it all shakes out here tonight. But should be a couple of good games between uh, these Maritime Division rivals. Game time, 7 o'clock. Gareth with the call from the ice. Gareth, appreciate your time, sir. Hey, no worries, Dan. Happy to chat. That is Gareth McDonald. He uh, will be with us all season on our hockey coverage for the Halifax Mooseheads. It's Moose season, everybody. And, uh, yeah, a pleasant surprise, I think, is the way to describe the Halifax Moosehead start to the season. Will it continue? Can we perhaps continue to surprise people? Only time will tell. We need to stop and take a break. Shelly's in to tell us what's going on in the world in the news. And on the other side of that, we're going to throw open the telephone lines. It is time for house calls. Dr. John Gillis will be our guest. If you have a medical-related question, this is your opportunity to get it answered, maybe get a second opinion, or maybe this might be uh, something that you've been wanting to ask for some time. Something's been bugging you. Here's your chance. Free access to a doctor. How often can we say that? You're listening to The Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Alstrand. Back in minutes. Thanks. Dr. John, Dr. John. You're my medicine man. Dr. John, Dr. John. You're my medicine man. I don't use no potion. I don't use no pill. Just give me a little love and care. I can cure your ills. Welcome back to the Todd Vino Show. It's Wednesday, just after the 11 o'clock news, and that means it's time to welcome back to the program our resident doctor, Dr. John Gillis. Dr. John, how are you? Doing well, thanks. How are things? Good. It's it's uh, it's opening day today. Leafs, Canadians, what are your thoughts for the Maple Leafs as we, we, we head optimistically on to the new season? It's like being a tornado chaser. It, uh, it always seems exciting until... Until, until you the catch, tears. until you catch it, <laughs> then what do you yeah. do with it, right? Exactly. Anyway, it'll be uh, be an interesting season. I know many people uh, are are gonna tune in tonight to see that uh, that season kick off. If you have a medical question for Doctor John, it's it's simple. Just dial the number nine zero two four zero five six thousand. That's nine zero two four zero five six thousand. He'll be here for the next hour to answer your medical related questions. Uh, Dr. John, got an email from last week that uh, I saved because uh, I I wanted to ask you this question. Uh, It it reads like this. My grandson has celiac disease. What is it, and what should I cook when he comes to visit? Well, celiac is the body reacting to gluten, which is, you know, a, a, a wheat component of many things we eat, particularly, you know, breads and pastas, but a lot of other things. Um, and celiac is basically when the body reacts abnormally to that and causes you know, inflammation in the bowel and a, a range of symptoms from you know, pain, diarrhea, mucus, that sort of thing. Uh, a very legitimate diagnosis, uh, which uh, unfortunately has to some degree been clouded by some uh, you know, hype around, you know, people who are, you know, gluten intolerant or these sorts of things, which there isn't a whole lot of evidence to. So someone who's actually been diagnosed with celiac disease with, you know, with a blood test and a biopsy, um, you know, it's a relatively uncommon, but, you know, serious and, uh, you know, a condition that if you do not remove, you know, gluten-based products or gluten-containing products from your diet, you know, a lot of problems and it's totally legit. Now, again, we see, uh, walking down the street, uh, you'll see, uh, you know, steak for supper, guaranteed gluten free. Oh, there's never been uh, there's never been gluten in a in a piece of beef. But so you know, understanding some of this misinformation is is important too. But you know, to come back to the question, you know, there's lots of information uh, out there. But you know, it's gluten, and you know, the answer is, what are you going to cook? You're going to cook gluten free. And you know, we see increasingly, you know, in a positive way, the uh, you know the restaurant industry. You know, marking you know foods that are that are gluten free and that sort of thing, so people know. Or gluten free options. You know, you can get a pizza crust that's gluten free. You can get bread that's gluten free. Um, you know, but just having that knowledge and knowing when to ask and, and what to cook, uh, 
is important. You know, so you know, for grandson's benefit there. Is it is it sort of along the lines of things like you would make with flour or wheat or something like that? Yeah, generally speaking, but I mean, it's you'd be surprised what you know what may contain gluten that you might not expect. I mean, even you know, beer. I mean, it's hard to find uh, you know gluten-free beer or low gluten beer. I got a buddy who's celiac, and he's always looking for. He likes Budweiser because Budweiser, you know, I didn't know this until recently, is made with rice. Yeah. It's not made with wheat. Um, so, uh, little things like that, just knowledge and understanding. Does the body need glutens? Dr. John, do we need, is it something that our body needs and, and those that are, are, are have celiac disease have to, to sort of find a different way to get that? No, not really. It's just, uh, you know, it's a, you know, a part of certain types of wheat and uh, wheat, you know, grains that we eat, you know, the nutrients are available in other things. It's just sort of a, you know, call it a weird sensitivity that, you know, has developed over, over millennia and uh, that we're now aware of and know how to screen for and treat. Can you treat celiac disease? Is it curable? Not really, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's avoidance. Um, you know, it's, it's simply that. And, you know, there are, you know, within the realm of it, you know, there are some people who can tolerate a little bit. But, you know, back to this, you know, I'm intolerant of gluten when there's no evidence of that. Mm. Uh, it's, it's hard to pick that apart. And, look, there are people that have, that can be sensitive to certain foods without having an actual allergy or a, uh, an actual medical condition, and that you know that's real. I mean, people who want to, you know, evaluate their diet. There are people that find that you know, even though they test negative for celiac, they do better when they eliminate grains or breads, and, that, and that's okay. If they feel better, uh, that's okay. Uh, you know, as long as they're not, uh, you know, being, you know, sold supplements and things that are that are false for their to treat their their so-called gluten intolerance. It's really a matter of finding what works for you and uh, what what's healthy and positive. The telephone number is 902-405-6000. If you have a medical-related question you'd like the doctor to answer, this is your opportunity. The lines are wide open. You can get on real quick and get on with your day. Again, that number is 902-405-6000. Got an email here, Dr. John, uh, when the show kicked off today about vitamin D. With shorter daylight hours in the late fall and winter, should I be taking a vitamin D supplement? Yeah, I mean, the vitamin D uh, is generated by the body partially in exposure to sunlight, so that, you know, that's valid. Um, you know, most people, you know, if they drink enough milk or are in the sun, uh, you know, during the summer or the shoulder seasons, the spring and the fall, do generate enough. But, you know, it, it is something that is, is worth, you know, testing. Uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of constant blood work, but having a, having a, sight line on what your vitamin D level is periodically is not unreasonable. And that can give people an idea. Do they need to be supplementing or are they just fine? Uh, but the, the idea of if you are going to supplement, uh, you know, the winter tends to be a better time to do it because you're not getting the sunlight, which in turn is, you know, helping create um, vitamin D. So the supplements, you know, tend to be more uh, needed and are useful in the winter. What's your thoughts on you What's your thoughts on Arizona. those? those are, yeah, fair enough. I'll move to Arizona tomorrow. Uh, what are your thoughts on those those uh, those UV lamps that people, the happy lamps, do they work? Uh, you, you talking about for vitamin D or yes. for light light for mood? Well, well, vitamin D to start. Yeah, I mean, the, the answer is probably. It, it sort of depends on... Uh, on the quality and what uh, you know, what type of light they're putting out, and uh, again, there's a there's a bit of hype there. Um, you know, are you getting something that's actually doing the job? So, you know, is it uh, is the idea legitimate? Yes. Um, you want to make sure you're getting something that's actually producing the right type of uh, light. Dr. John's with us for the next uh, 45 minutes. If you have a question, there's a couple people on the line, but there are a number of open lines if you want to get on. This is your chance. 902 405 6000. We're going to take our first break. You're listening to House Calls on the Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand. We're back in minutes. Welcome back to the Tavino Show. It's House Calls. He's Dr. John Gillis. The telephone number is 902-405-6000. If you have a medical-related question, Dr. John will be here to answer it for you, just like Brian has. Brian, how are you? 
Hi, how are you? Good. Your question for Dr. John, please. Yes, uh, what causes I H. pylori? Dr. John, are you there? Sorry, how'd you mute it? Uh, H. pylori is short for Helicobacter pylori, which is a bacteria that lives in a few places, but mainly in the stomach. And uh, when it grows or grows too much, uh, can cause stomach irritation and ulcers. So the short answer, what causes it? Um, I mean, it's something that everybody's exposed to. Um, you know, for varying reasons of degree of exposure, diet, uh, acid levels, medication, some people, you know, will develop an overgrowth of it, whereas others won't. Um, and, you know, this is a common thing that we'll test for when we see people having, you know, stomach problems, ulcers, that sort of thing. But it's not, you know, it's not like necessarily you catch it, uh, you know, from, you know, sharing a glass with somebody uh, in the in the traditional sense of being contagious. Uh, but, you know, it, there's different ways you can be exposed to it. All right, great. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a, a GP, and I had a, I developed, I, I think I've had it for a while. I finally went to Dr. Boat in the spring, and uh, she gave me a run of uh, moxicillin uh, antibiotics, and it seemed to fix it, and then I ended up with uh, an abscess tooth and, I, tooth, and I ran more a month still for that, and then it came back on me, and then this fall, I, I ran the more antibiotics, a whole different batch, different drugs, and I'm just got, getting over them, and uh, yeah, it's just something that's really upset my gut, and I just wondering what, what's causing it. Yeah, so certainly it could be that. I mean, if people have been on a lot of antibiotics, often the problem is that it those antibiotics kill the regular bacteria in the gut, and you know, you can get, you know, bad stuff like C. diff, uh, you know, which can be a serious infection, but sometimes it just messes up the balance, doesn't cause a serious problem, but just causes, you know, issues with gas, cramps, diarrhea, different stuff like that. So it may just be, you know, your gut's recovering from being on all the antibiotics, you know, which is, again, another reason why we, you know, encourage people, you know, take it if you need it, but, uh, you know, choose wisely, as they say, when, uh, when taking antibiotics, we still see them prescribed too much for, you know, viral infections and such. Thanks for the call, Brian. 902 405 6000 is the number. That's 902 405 6000. If you have a medical related question, Dr. John here to answer them. We welcome Bill to the program. Bill, how are you? Good morning. How are you this morning? Good. Your question for Dr. John, please. Dr. Gillis, uh, about 12 months ago, I had a prostate uh, surgery procedure done at a private clinic in Montreal. And uh, as a 12-month uh, follow-up, they would like me to have an, uh, an ultrasound of the bladder and prostate. Uh, and they have sent, sent me uh, an order or, uh, for that. And I'm just wondering, is that acceptable in Halifax, where I live? Or would that be rejected, an out-of-province uh, requisition for ultrasound? Yeah, it's, it's a hard question to answer. Um, the answer is kind of it depends on the jurisdiction. It depends on the province. So, for example, you know, I, I actually I have a license in five provinces now. I, I've, I've had one in Ontario for a long time. Recently, they brought in the Atlantic Registry, so if you have a license in one of the Atlantic provinces, you can, you know, for a nominal fee and uh, a form, they give you a license in the other three Atlantic provinces. So since I've had that, uh, I've had an easier time ordering tests for, you know, I have a few patients in New Brunswick, uh, a few in PEI and a couple in Newfoundland. Uh, prior to that, I found it to be hit or miss. Sometimes... Uh, they would take the requisition from another province doc. Sometimes they wouldn't. Um, and Quebec, you know, Quebec has some issues um, with, um, you know, on physician fees, for example, they won't pay out of province. But that shouldn't be applicable ordering a test. I just don't know how the hospital will react to it. So really, um, you have to submit it and see what they say. Now, I guess that's the question. Did did the doctor in Quebec submit it for you? Did they send it into the hospital, or did they tell you to do that yourself? 
No, no, they sent it to, directly to me. I have it in my hand as I speak. So I, I don't know who to ask or, uh, or contact in the Nova Scotia system to say I have a, a requisition in my hand for an ultrasound of the bladder in the prostate from Quebec. Is that, should I show up with that or will you reject me on arrival? Yeah, do you have a family doctor here? Uh, he's packing up his desk as he, as we speak, so I don't know if I can catch him. <laughs> he's gonna, he's heading off to retirement. Yeah, I mean, the easiest thing to do would be to have your Nova Scotia GP, if you can, send it off. Uh, okay. Failing that, I mean, you, you don't get an ultrasound by showing up. That's not how it works. It, the rec has to be oh. sent in, and they, they book you for it. Uh, probably what I would do is, would be to call, you know, I don't know where you're located, but to call the diagnostic imaging department at your nearest hospital and say, look, I've got this requisition, what do I do with it? They may just say, bring it into us. They may say it's no good. Um, you know, and if, if that doesn't work, you may be left with trying to get a, a local requisition either from a walk-in clinic or from, you know, the, one of the online services like Maple, um, you know, where, you know, some, you know, for something that's, you know, a follow-up like this, they, they would probably do for you. But again, those, there's no guarantee. So that's the process I would follow. Thanks for the call, Bill. I appreciate it. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. If you have a medical-related question, here's your chance. Lots of lines open for you today, and we'll welcome Anne to the show. Anne, how are you? I'm great. How are you guys today? Good. Your question, please. Uh, Dr. John, I'm calling regarding microscopic blood in the urine. Um, it seems to be, from what I can remember, I've had it for probably at least 15 years. I've never, ever, ever even given it a thought, or I'm not concerned about it. Doctors don't always seem overly concerned about it when they do the urine test. I have no symptoms of anything. So, but I thought I'd call today while it wasn't busy just to ask, uh, should I worry about that? Because I'm not really concerned if I have no other issues. Not typically. I mean, if you're not seeing any obvious blood or hematuria, uh, you're not having pain, you're not having, you know, other issues. Uh, it's a fairly common thing that we see, and you know, we just tend to watch it to look for a change. Um, you know, is there a change in something else? You know, is the urine volume changing? Are you having infections? Are you having, you know, painful episodes? So, you know, it, the advice you've been given to date is, is, is reasonable unless there's a change which might merit... Uh, some imaging to take a look at your bladder and kidneys. But would it be, would, is it normal maybe that a certain amount of population has that? Is that something that would just maybe be just some people have it? Yeah, like I said, it's fairly common. I couldn't give you a number on that, but, you know, we see, I see that fairly frequently. And, again, if, it, if it's stable and not changing and in the absence of other problems, uh, we usually just keep an eye on it. Thanks for the call, Anna. Appreciate it. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. I've got two emails from two different people, Dr. John, asking about if you've heard of or have any knowledge of any kind of uh, uh, long-term neurological issues that have that are starting to spring up now as a result of vaccines from COVID. Have you heard anything about this? Uh, I, I think it's fair to say you, you hear stuff... Um, but it's hard to know what's real. I, I have not seen any definitive information on long-term neurologic effects from COVID vaccines, no. It's the, it's the short answer. Fair enough. We're going to uh, stop down take our uh, next break here on the program on the uh, house calls with Dr. John as I put him on hold and don't lose him. I'm trying to be a good host today. If you have a medical-related question, if you have uh, something that's been bothering you or something that you'd like the doctor to, to perhaps uh, listen to you and see what he thinks, this is a great opportunity. We've got a number of lines open for you today. The telephone number is 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. House calls for with Dr. John Gillis will continue after the break. But first, I wanted to uh, uh, to just spend a few minutes before we go back to to house calls uh, to to share a story with you that happened to me. And uh, and while uh, Dr. John can listen to this in the background, that happened to me uh, the other day at the grocery store. And I was uh, it it's it sort of lightened my view on humanity. And I thought it would be just a one of those smile stories that uh, can take us off into the break. I was I was in the checkout line. I was waiting for 
uh, to get through and to pay my bill and do those kind of things. And um, there was in an aisle next to me, there was a uh, an older gentleman that had, you know, four or five things in his cart and he had a really old, it looked like an old $50 Canadian bill. Like I'm talking like old, old school bill. And it was torn and, and uh, the, the store didn't want to accept it. And they told him, that he had to go to the bank in order to get that taken care of because that currency is, is so old and there was some, you know, it was tape on it and it was tape and it was torn, anything. Anyway, uh, he said, well, I, you know, I've got nothing else. I can't, I pay for this. So I'll go put this back. And, and the person behind him in line said, uh, no, no, don't worry about it. I took care of it. Every once in a while, something happens that makes me smile and uh, it's good for your health to do things nice. We're back with House Calls after the break. You're listening to the Tavino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand. Back in minutes. Welcome back to the Tavino Show. House Calls for the next 30 minutes. Dr. John is here to answer your questions. Telephone lines are wide open. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Your chance, uh, if you've been on the fence about asking a question, here's a good opportunity for you. You get uh, get on right away because the lines are open. 902-405-6000. Dr. John, uh, an email question during the break from Albert. It says, how long do the effects of pneumonia last? I've had it for over a month. I've been treated with antibiotics and a puffer. My blood oxygen saturation was 85%, and now it's about 97 He says, I feel better, but I still have a cough, phlegm, and get tired easily. When can I start working in my yard without it getting worse? Yeah, it's really as tolerated. People recover differently. Um, you know, it depends how extensive the pneumonia was and how many parts of the lung. Depends on your other health issues. It depends on, you know, what bacteria was causing it and, you know, how effective the antibiotics were. So often with any type of infection, whether it's bacterial or viral, you'll see some inflammation that persists, which is why people continue to cough, even though the, the offending bug has been killed. So... You know, my advice is usually take your time, you know, raise your activity as tolerated, continue to use the puffers, and it, you know, should get back to normal. But it can it can take some time. And, you know, this is one of the things that we saw with COVID and a lot of the, you know, some of the other viruses going around is that people do have these lingering effects. And uh, and I guess the other point I'll make, I'm just going to assume based on, you know, the diagnosis and everything that, you know, somebody was actually had x-ray proof of a bacterial pneumonia. We often... You know, I would say too often have people who have viral infections that resolve on their own but get put on antibiotics and still have that sort of lingering effect because the inflammation takes a while to go away. But regardless, as long as you're on the mend, that's a good sign and it should continue to improve. If it's not, definitely worth getting another look to make sure there's not uh, not something else going on. 902-405-6000, 902-405-6000 is the number. We'll get to George's question here in a second. Got an other interesting email, Dr. John, and, and I'm, it's kind of something I wasn't expecting. This was uh, from a, a listener who says, Hi, Dr. John, I'm graduating from high school next year, and I'm considering becoming a doctor. Any advice? We lost him. Are you still there? Yeah, just mute it for a second. All good. Uh, probably the advice I would give is uh, diversify your life. If you want to get in uh, to medical school, um, diversify your life. So, you, you know, you need science, you need math, you need to do well in school, but you also have to live. And, you know, increasingly, uh, and, you know, this is a positive thing, uh, you know, schools are looking for people uh, with life experience, with volunteer experience, people who have traveled, people who have who have done things uh, and, and moving away from just academics. Academics are important, uh, but it's 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 really that balance that they're looking for, and uh, you know, for people that can identify with other people that can, you know, put themselves in people's shoes and aren't just great with a book but don't have the, you know, the life experience and the empathy. So just get out there, live, do well in school, but you know, go play sports, go travel, go volunteer, you know, uh, live, enjoy. That's are you, what I would say. Are you still seeing lots of lots of young doctors coming through the system, Doctor John? I know that that you know we we hear the stories of how hard you all work and that you're spending you know mega hours in the ER and those kind of things. Are are they still coming up and still as optimistic as ever? 
Yeah, I mean, one of the, you know, I've, I've said this a few times on the show. One, one of the things that has improved uh, in the system, but also was not planned for and has caused a problem in the system, is that, you know, newer doctors are not working 70 hours a week and carrying 4,000 patients. They have learned to, you know, put a priority on life work balance, on family, and on, you know, making sure that, you know, their wellness and the wellness of their family is taken care of. Uh, some of that has come from the fact that we are fortunate to have a lot more women in medicine uh, who, you know, for, you know, different reasons, some around uh, having families, but just have it bringing, a, you know, a different and, and progressive approach have, have, you know, helped bring that mentality forward. So that's a great thing. And that's important uh, that, you know, you know, people aren't burning themselves out. The caveat is, you know, we're, we have docs in their 50s and 60s retiring who are carrying three and 4,000 patients. And some of the newer folks uh, are, you know, a new practice is taking on eight to 1,200 patients. So you may need, you know, two to two and a half to replace one. And, you know, nobody really planned for that when, uh, you know, whoever is responsible for tracking these things was, was doing so. Uh, you know, we thought, you know, people thought they had it covered. And what we've realized is the population has aged. And as the demographic of the physician workforce has changed, uh, it's been a double whammy. The, the, the need is higher, and the you know the way we're replacing uh, people ha- has not kept up. And you know, there's a lot of factors around that, but that's uh, that's been interesting. But I mean, t- t- the individuals coming through are fantastic, well trained, enthusiastic, and caring, and you know, you know. Everybody's different, of course, but generally that's the case. Uh, it's just we're, we're dealing with a with a demographic and an adjustment issue. Do you still recommend it? If somebody came up to you and said, hey, Dr. John, I'm thinking about going to medical school, do you say, yeah, go ahead, it's a fantastic career? Yeah, absolutely. As long as you know what you're, uh, what you're getting into. I, you know, I think, uh, you know, this lot of issues is, you know, make sure you live and enjoy your life as well beforehand and during. Um, you know, doctors are notoriously terrible about, you know, managing their lives and managing their finances. It's important to learn about those things. You know, you get tossed at a residency at 28, getting paid, uh, you know, good money, and you may not have any idea what to do with it or how to manage it. And, uh, you know, just you know, looking at those things, looking for mentors and looking for looking for balance, uh, you know, it's really important that we all, you know, work together and help each other. 902-405-6000 is the number. We welcome George to the show. George, your question for Dr. Gillis. Hi. Uh, my wife's had COVID twice, once in 2022 and once this past June. So the first time she had it, she lost the sense of taste and smell, and it took about 18 months to get it back. Uh, is there any kind of a treatment or accelerated way of getting that back other than I've seen a bunch of home remedies about uh, you know doing smell therapy and things like that yeah look I, I think it's the same thing uh, you know you hear a lot of stuff you you wonder if it's if it's valid or not um, you know I've had some people tell me that they've done that sort of sort of thing and it's 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 been helpful um, you know this some talk that you can do some injections for this sort of thing, perhaps with steroids uh, or, you know, early on with antiviral drugs. Um, I think it's, it's very nebulous right now. We don't have a lot of research is is probably the best answer I can give you. Uh, I know some people have been, you know, referred to, uh, you know, ear, nose and throat docs to, you know, get an assessment and some of the smell therapy comes from, you know, using strong scents to try and stimulate uh, things to get going again. Uh, and some people have had success with that. So there's a lot of information and perhaps misinformation out there. Um, you know, probably, you know, in a severe case, I would suggest a referral to an ENT for the most up-to-date information because there's a, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of decent info, a lot of good research, and a lot of uh, stuff that's a bit of hocus-pocus is what I would say. Yeah, I know. I I read something about a drug that's available that that accelerates the uh, the return, but it's only available in Japan. So I was wondering if there's anything being developed over here for that. Yeah, I'm not aware that there is, but uh, uh, that's interesting. I'll look into that. So, what's the drug called? Do you know? 
I, I can't remember right off the bat. Um, but yeah, it, it, yeah I, I read that it had been approved in Japan, uh, but not available in North America. Yeah, it's an antiviral drug. Uh, one of the drugs that ends in veer that nobody can pronounce. But uh, <laughs> uh, and again, they're doing research on it to see if it, uh, if given early, I think is the idea that it'll help uh, help that recover. So uh, I think you'll probably see more on that as uh, uh, as time time passes. But that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. And thanks for the call, George. The number 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. A couple of people on the line. A couple of lines open for you. We're going to take another break. You're listening to The Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand. He's Dr. John Gillis. We're both back in minutes. Thanks. Welcome back to the Tavino Show. Dan Allstrand here on a Wednesday. He's Dr. John Gillis. This is House Calls. The lines are open, 902-405-6000. If you have a medical-related question that you'd like the good doctor to answer, this is your opportunity. And we'll go right to the phone lines, and we will welcome Cheryl to the program. Cheryl, how are you? Fine, thank you. Your question, I please. have a question. Yes, I have. My question for Dr. Gillis is, I'm a senior, almost 70. I've had my hearing tested many, many times and have been told I do need hearing aids, but we have no pension plan. We're living on a fixed income, and we cannot afford hearing aids. Is there anything out there to help it? people? We're grateful for the dental program, but this is also for our hearing. We, we need to be able to hear. No, uh, so the short answer is not, not that I'm aware of. Um, yeah. you know, this this is this has come up in a few political cycles um, that we need to do better to support our seniors uh, who don't have the means to, um, you know, get hearing aids. Uh, you know, f- you know, for a number of reasons. First of all, you know, for for your own benefit. But it's you know, it's it, it's simple. If you can't hear, it's hard to do other things. It causes other problems with with health, with driving, with a whole host of other things. So, uh, you know, I, I agree there should be some support. And, uh, you know, as we move into uh, what we, I think, expect is an imminent provincial election, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, perhaps this issue will come up again. And, you know, I think it's important and it should be a nonpartisan issue. It's, uh, you know, something that, that is important. And, uh, you know, I believe I've, you know, I've seen it costed by some different folks a few times. Um, you know, folks are living longer and, you know, we need to take care of them. And, you know, even on the most cynical level, it will help prevent other problems, other health deteriorations and keep people, you know, productive and happy. And, you know, the cost, you know, should balance itself out, if not be on the positive side uh, by, by helping. So, you know, if anyone out there is aware of programs, uh, you know, to help folks, um, you know, you know, maybe you could let this, let the station know so we can get that word out there. There may be some you know, community programs or some groups that uh, that do try to help, but I'm not a you know. There's not something like the provincial pharmacare dental care program, but you know, I I do think this is something we should take seriously, and that you know it should be next. So, you know, again, thank you for raising it, and if anyone has info out there, uh, we we'd appreciate uh, hearing about it. Thanks for the call, Cheryl. Nine zero two four zero five six thousand. It it always is is a, a bit of a, a wonderment to me, Doctor John. Not to get too political with the whole thing, but how decisions are made on on what gets added and what doesn't to these programs, right? Like, I mean, a hearing aid is is not necessarily a a, a nice to have; it's a need to have. Yeah, that's right. And look, it's you know, all these things come down to cost and benefit. Who's eligible? And look, I, you know, I don't envy uh, people who make these decisions. I you know, I agree. This one does seem like a new brainer, and I think we'll get there. Um, you know, there are people who have to make decisions about, you know, very expensive drugs that, for example, may give someone another three to six months or give them a five to 10 percent greater chance of a cure. And, you know, how do you put a price on that? How do you put a price on someone's loved one and their survival? And, you know, what three to six months may mean to that that person and, and, and their family? And it's uh, it's it's tough. It, uh, you know, I don't envy people making those decisions. And, you know, I, I think generally 
you know, most people in government, you know, are trying to do these things, you know, for the right reasons and trying to make the best decisions they, they can with the, with the, uh, you know, funds they have available. But again, you know, we, we have seen some progress uh, in recent years, you know, on, on pharmacare, on dental care, on child care. And, um, you know, we've got to remember uh, to take care of our seniors. I mean, uh, the, the people who built, uh, built, built our country uh, need to be supported. 902-405-6000. It's 902-405-6000. Let us welcome Barbara to the program. Barbara, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good. Your question, please. Look, uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Gillis. I have developed a condition called milia, spelled B M I L I A. And can you tell me what causes it and what can I do to clear it up? Uh, who diagnosed that? <laughs> Dr. Google. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what it was, but I, I developed these these little bumps right under my skin, and and I didn't know what it was, so I went on there to before I made an appointment with my doctor, and that's what it said it was, and it said it would clear itself up, but it didn't say how long it would take or anything, so I just was wondering if you could give me a little information on that, because most people never heard yeah. all of it. Yeah, I mean, they're, the other name for these things is milk spots. Uh, they're white spots under the skin, and they're uh, much more common and actually in newborns, uh, in kids. And as you said, they, they do normally go away on their own. Um, you know, a little less common uh, in adults. Um, you know, why do they happen? Um, you know, the, the sh- usual answer is just because the way the, you know, the skin reacts to certain things it's exposed to um you know the treatment is usually nothing because they usually do go away on your t- uh, on their own however um you know there are s- some drugs that we use for treating you know you think of acne drugs that can help uh help settle it down uh, you know so usually what we recommend is people wait but uh you know if it's if it's getting worse uh typically the the, the pattern the plan is to refer someone uh, to a dermatologist to see if other medication you know such as some of these kind of anti-acne trinitoin type medications uh, are needed have you been referred to a dermatologist yet no i haven't i haven't been to my doctor yet yeah so i, I would i would the... start there okay i couldn't get an appointment with him until the 21st and i just heard you on and, and i was going to call last week and i didn't think about it in time so I just wanted to know uh, uh, what I could do and how long it might take. And they're not getting any worse. Yeah, no, that's fair. So it, I, I guess there's a couple of things. The first thing is this is most likely nothing serious. It'll likely go away on its own. Uh, I would plan to get in and have your doctor take a look at it, but I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be uh, too, too worried about it. Thanks for the call, Barbara. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Uh, just about out of time, Dr. John, got an email question. It says uh, here, uh, I've been diagnosed with sleep apnea. I'm having trouble sleeping with the CPAP machine. Are there any alternatives to that therapy? Uh, yeah, I mean, sleep apnea is when you stop breathing when, you know, you're trying to sleep and, you know, can defect, affect sleep patterns and cause other health problems. CPAP is, you know, the mask or prongs that you put in that kind of use, you know, effectively forced air humidified to keep uh, the back of your throat open or your, you know, your tongue from collapsing. Uh, and they can be very effective, but some people have a hard time tolerating. Uh, it, it depends a little bit on the cause and people's anatomy, but, you know, there are surgical options. Uh, there are mouth guards. Uh, you know, I wear one. Um, it's called a mandibular advancement device. If I if I think if I remember to put it in, hmm. but just the, the shape of my jaw is what causes. I don't have apnea, but you know, I grind my teeth and I wake myself up, and I you know would make me snore when I have this thing in. Pulls my jaw forward a bit, and those things go away. So that is an option for some people. So that may be worth having a having a chat, uh, you know, with your dentist about or whoever uh, prescribed the CPAP machine. So the, the 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 best route is to talk to the people, perhaps at the, the sleep clinic, right, where you where you got this done. Yeah, and or you know, and or dentist. I mean, the sleep clinic wouldn't be, um, you know, and there may be a reason why that was not considered. Mm. 
um, you know, talk to them, but also, uh, you know, if you have a dentist, uh, not all dentists do these things, but would have a, typically have a colleague or a referral process uh, to get it done. Dr. John, we're out of time. Enjoy the game tonight. Thank you. Take care. That is Dr. Bye. John Gillis. He's with us every Wednesday from 11 until 12 to answer your medical-related questions. Make sure you get in early next week, and that way you won't be disappointed. We're going to stop down and take a break, and on the other side of that break, we're going to open up the telephone lines. It's time for the midweek meltdown. Something's been bugging you since the beginning of the week. This is your opportunity to talk about it. This is your chance to to raise some awareness on an issue or perhaps continue the discussions that we've had already this week. The telephone lines are open, 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Very quickly, just saw a note came across my desk, and Shelly's going to get mad at me because I'm going to scoop her here, but uh, Nova Scotia Premier Tim Houston says the police now investigating a theft of an undisclosed amount of money from his riding association fund. Houston says he learned of the theft from the Picto East Progressive Conservative Riding Association Monday, immediately reported it to police in New Glasgow. The Premier says he doesn't know exactly how much money was taken, but adds the amount probably is in the thousands of dollars. Houston says Elections Nova Scotia has been notified in the Riding Association, working closely with a local bank to try and figure out what happened. He says a volunteer he's known for many years has been dismissed from the association and the party. Houston says he feels, and I quote here, an incredible sense of betrayal over the matter. Might be something you want to talk about in the open hour. Again, the lines are open. The number 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. The open hour after the news. You're listening to the Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand. We're back in minutes. Well, welcome back to the Tavino Show. Dan Allstrain along with you here. It's time now for the Midweek Meltdown. This is your opportunity to talk about whatever it is on your mind. The telephone number is 902-405-6000. We have a few people on the line, but a number of open lines if you you want to get on and, and talk about whatever it is. Maybe something we talked about earlier this week. Maybe something we talked about earlier this this month or this year. Or maybe something we haven't talked about already and you want to raise some awareness on it. This is your opportunity, 902-405-6000. That is the number. I know uh, a number of you are looking forward to the kickoff tonight of the uh, NHL. Well, technically the NHL season started already, uh, but the the Canadian teams are in action tonight, and and we get to see the first incarnation of the uh, 2024-2025 Montreal Canadiens and the Toronto Maple Leafs, and uh, y'all know where my loyal- loyalties lie, and I'm looking forward to to seeing if uh, some of these new additions that have been added to the much maligned Toronto Maple Leafs will actually make a difference. I'm a little suspect, but maybe that's because I'm a long-suffering Leaf fan, and, and for whatever reason, this team just doesn't want me to see them win a Stanley Cup. It's always about me, right? Anyway, that might be something you want to talk about. Halifax Mooseheads, by the way, are on the road tonight. You'll catch that game right here at 7 o'clock. They're in Bathurst to take on the T10. Gareth McDonald will be joining us after 7. With all the call from the ice as the herd enjoy a good start to their season uh, to get all the sports stuff out of the way. Also, some shockwaves coming uh, into political circles here in Nova Scotia today. The Premier held a, a rather hastily called news conference. I got an email about it this morning, a couple hours before it happened. And that's where he revealed that police are investigating the theft of an undisclosed amount of money from his riding association fund. The Premier says he learned of the theft from the Picto East. It's his conservative riding association, too, in Picto East. On Monday, then reported it immediately to New, the New Glasgow police. Premier says he doesn't know how much money was taken but adds it could be in the thousands of dollars. He says that they've also notified Elections Nova Scotia and are working closely with a local bank. And a long-time uh, volunteer that he's known for many years has now been dismissed from the association and from the party. The Premier adds that he's feeling an incredible sense of betrayal about the whole thing. So 
This is not the first time. We were just chatting about this, and, and, and maybe the first time for the Conservatives, but this isn't the first time in, in Nova Scotia politics. I think this the same sort of thing with a bit of a twist happened a few years back with the Liberal Riding Association, the Liberal Party. I remember Zach Churchill was just taking over as the leader of the Liberals and uh, had to, to come out and explain uh, some of the circumstances surrounding that. So now uh, more theft in uh, political circles in the provincial politics this time in the Picto East Progressive Conservative Riding Association. Uh, interesting times, isn't it? Let's get right to the phones. And we welcome Paul to the show. Paul, how are you? How are you, Chuck? Good, I'm good. What's up? Well, I'm glad you brought that subject up because I'm wondering what the, the mayor's pension is going to be. I don't know. Ah, <laughs> bull. Wait, what, did you just say bull? Well, do you I think I know what the mayor's pension is going to be? No, I have, no, I keep no, that no, number in my no, wallet. Right there now, Todd. Uh, my name's Dan, by the way. It's not Todd. Any- and uh, if if you think I keep the mayor's salary or his pension in my back pocket and know it off the top of my head, I don't. Appreciate the call. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Let's welcome Bill to the program. Bill, how are you? You can hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, sir. What's on your mind today? Well, uh, I'm concerned about uh, heritage, and I'll give you a little bit of history, too, at the same time, means you get a little bit of time. Uh, first of all, we start off with the, with the Fleming Tower. The uh, man that put that there, uh, so I forget, Sir Joe's, I know it was Sir John, or, but anyway, it's Fleming. Fleming Tower on Northwest Island, the big tower. It needs some pointing of the, of the brickwork on that tower. But the one area that concerns me is the person that uh, it's named after Fleming, who's got a little house or had a little house on the drive going down to the tower. Now, I'm concerned about different properties that are just laying there deteriorating. Why they don't rent them out or, or whatever, spend more time. So that's that one. Uh, the next one I'm talking about is Bill Lynch on McNabb's Island. Mm-hmm. His house, Bill Lynch's house, okay? Uh, that, I think, province owns that one. And they've also got uh, his sister there right next door, the big house. These properties are going down. It should be rented or something. That Bill Lynch's house is very unique. And, uh, and underneath they're keeping it up is a great big uh, mass from some old ship. I don't know what the history is. But, you know, they should be looking after this. these properties, rent the moat, because then you'd have, especially in McNabb Sound, you'd have somebody over there to keep an eye on things from the province, cheap rent. You know, there's a lot of history there. McNabb's Island there, I remember we were over there at the big bottle dig. There was a brewery over there, believe it or not, where they, A.J. Davis, Pure McNabb, it was called. And we discovered the, we were in the bottle club, and we had quite a time on that there. There's a lot of history uh, on McNabb's Island, Lawless Island there, and even George's Island. George's Island used to be looked look after during the wartime by one of the Owen family, one of the head Owens. Mm. Over there on uh, Lawless Island, there was a quarantine station. I remember seeing one of these here, uh, Hearst in the barn over there. And also on uh, McNabb's Island, you, you've got uh, the McNabb's Island Society, which got a lot of history there that people may want to look up, but I'll tell you, there's uh, a lot there, but particularly the Bill Lynch's properties. I remember there going over there when he passed on, bringing all the stuff that was in the garage over there, over here and auctioning it off. But that's a little history lesson for you. By the way, Devil's Island was a pirate owned that one. There you have it. Way back when, yep, for sure. I think around the 1700s. That's a few years ago, Bill. (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of little stuff there that people don't know about about the history, and it's a shame. So there's these major building 
You got that weather thing out there in uh, Princess Lodge or whatever you call it there. I, I think the province got that and they got it rented out. But there's some history stuff there for for, for your folks. Are you talking about the rotunda on the side of the highway? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I think it's. I think it's rented. But that's another one that should be preserved. I think that's a was is. a was a music room at one point, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Well, it was something to do with the royalty from England, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the well, the prince that built the the lodge. Prince anyway, lodge, yeah. Bill, I appreciate the there call. There you are, sir. Thank you. Have a good one. Nine zero two four zero five six thousand. That's nine zero two four zero five six thousand. It's such a beautiful building, right? And it's just kind of plunked right there between the the Bedford Highway and the uh, and the the train tracks, and it just kind of sits there. Everybody drives by it, but there is some history attached to that that room, and and I've read a little bit about it and. And how back in the old days, and I'm putting quotes around the old days, it would they would actually have to to either row or sail to Prince's Lodge, which is what you know, without traffic, and we won't get into that. Well, maybe we'll get into traffic, but it takes what ten minutes from here, maybe if you're if you're if you get all of the lights. And it used to be a like a whole day's outing to get from where the town site was here in uh, on the peninsula to the Prince's Lodge. So it's uh, it's interesting how things have changed and. And it's a piece of history that we drive by every single day and don't even know. Another quick anecdote with a piece of history. I was having a conversation, it might even have been Bill, uh, about uh, some of the, the older buildings in downtown Halifax. And and, uh, and I think he told me, and I think I've read it in, in some of the history books as well, that the the foundation that is underneath the Carlton, which we're all familiar with on Argyle Street, is actually comes from stones that were part of the first Lewisburg. So put that in your cap, Bill. Nine zero two four zero five six thousand nine zero two four zero five six thousand. A couple lines open if you want to get in. We'll take a break. This is the midweek meltdown. I'm Dan Allstrand. We're back in minutes. Welcome back to the Tavino Show. Dan Allstrand along with you. The Midweek Meltdown. The telephone number 902-405-6000. We welcome John to the program. John, how are you? Yeah, not too bad, Dan. Listen, this fellow just called in about the mayor's pension, right? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, what is his salary? 200000 I have no idea. You know the salary? Oh, uh, well, the, the mayor's it's... salary, I can look yeah. it up. But it's, 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 I think, I think it's North. I think it's, uh, yeah, and I, I I mean, I'm, I'm not going to give you a wrong number. No, so no, no, it. but anyway, let's let's round it off at 200000 a year. Yep. Uh, his pension would be, and that would, that's 2% a year, I, uh, uh, and he'll get 24% of the 200, which is 4000 per month. That's what he would get. Okay, and, and that's, the, that's the HRM pension plan, correct? Yes. Now, but when Gerald Butts was in, and he jumped ship with the Clayton, the Bellins, and Shaw group, which was a conflict event because he knew all the plans. Uh, he he knew he was going to have a little rough time there. But what he did, I don't know which bunch he he, he, uh, he did it for, but he said that he's going to gold plate certain persons' pensions. So maybe Savage is in on the gold plated one. So it could be more than four thousand. Well, I then I, I, I don't know the answer, and he was an MP. Well, I know we know we know he's going to get. Uh, 24% of the... Of, of his whatever. salary, yes. And he yeah. was also, and, and I think time in has something to do with that as well, doesn't it? Isn't that how that accrues? I think, yes. And he yeah. was also in Ottawa, in Ottawa for, I think, seven years, so that means he qualifies for a, for a federal pension. Well, I, mean, I don't know what the numbers are. But he needs it, you know. He far needs it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, good enough. Have a good one, John. See, there you go. Smart people out there. I was actually just looking it up, and, and uh, everything that uh, that John told us about that uh, the pension plan is correct, and I do believe... That uh, the mayor, current mayor and councilor are on uh, on the, the latest one, which is the same pension that everybody uh, that works for the municipality of HRM is entitled to. Moving on, Jim. Good more afternoon, Dan. How are you? Great. I want to tell you something about that city pension. And everybody talks about how great that pension is. I worked there all my life. The yep. best thirty years of my life, I worked for the city of Halifax. I get twenty thousand a year. There you go. So us work the the working stiffs that are out there driving snow plows and raking asphalt and finishing cement, we don't get no big pensions. It's 
the people who get the big pensions are the management. Like, uh, you know, I don't need to name the positions, but sure. the little guy like John and I, we don't get any big pensions. 20000 I'm happy to have it, though. I want to talk about 57 years. It's time the Maple Leafs finally win that Stanley <laughs> You're Cup. Not kidding, and man. this is the year, is it? Dan. This is the year, buddy. How many times <laughs> in those last 57 years, Jim, how many times have you said that? Those words, this is the year. 57, 57. <laughs> right? But I, I don't want to replace your sports reporter there. The caller comes in, Eric. Yep. Eric O'Rourke. He's a city worker, too, by the way. He probably makes the same amount as me. There you go. But he knows more about sports than I'll ever know, and he'll agree with me. This is the year the Toronto Maple Leafs are going to win the Stanley Cup. Well, Jim, I've got you on the record now on tape, so when this doesn't happen, because that's the way I feel about it, then I can play it again in, uh, in June. How's that? Uh, that that'll be fine, but um, you know Matthews is you know Matthews is going to have another sixty plus goal year, and Mitch Marner on the line with him. He's got a lot to prove in his contract year. He'll have another big year, and we got a couple of new defensemen. We might add another one later on, and uh, if those Boston Bruins want to give up on that Jeremy Swayman, they don't want to pay him. So we'll be happy to take him on if we can find a little bit of cap space. And tonight, they're playing each other, of course. I know you know that. Yep. And that big hab defenseman, Jack Eye, or whatever his name wow, is. Oh, he's a pretty tough he, guy, right? He, yeah, he's a, yeah, well, he's going to get some R&R tonight in the form of Ryan Reeves. You think? Ryan, Ryan's going to hammer him into the ice like a spike in the wood tonight. There you go. You heard it here first. It's going to be a great game. Good, good luck to the Leafs, and we're going to win the Cup. There you go, Jim. I appreciate the call. Holy skull. Holy skull. Cheers. 902 6000 uh, It's. I'm not going to reveal my age, but I have yet to see the Toronto Maple Leafs win a Stanley Cup in my lifetime. And I just once, just once, is that too much to ask? Is that is that so difficult for the hockey gods that just once in my lifetime I'd like to see the Toronto Maple Leafs lift the Stanley Cup? Just once. I don't want a de- destiny. I don't want one of these... You know, these, these perennial teams that are, are good for four and five and six and that. No, just I, I one and I'm ha- one and done. I'm happy. Let's welcome Rob to the program. Rob, how are you? Hey, how you doing? Good. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, you're going to burst my bubble, man. Oh, no, it, you know better. I do. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Anyways, uh, just to touch on what we were talking about yesterday, sure. uh, you know, both Mr. Fillmore. So, of course, yes, um, what you, you said, you know, up in Ottawa, when you're there, you better be a team player or you're out the door. Well, right. we, all, we all know that. We all know that's how that works. But that brings the question, okay, was that what he, is that what Mr. Fillmore was doing when he was in Ottawa? Was he, you know, he voted carbon tax, he voted for various things. Is, was he just trying to stay on the team so he could represent constituents back here but you're going to have him on, aren't you? Yeah, it's on Friday. I'm working to get him on Friday on the show. Yeah, but maybe you could ask him specifically. You know, because the Trudeau, we know, we know the Trudeau government's done some things that have caused a lot of pain for the people in Canada and in Halifax. Mm-hmm. Whether it's a carbon tax pushing the cost of everything up, and like I said, lots of people coming pushing the cost of housing and making some apartments and housing on a. T- you just can't get one. So. I think these are questions we need to ask him. What, where does he stand on these issues now that he's not in Ottawa? Yep. With, because as far as I know, everybody says, well, there's lots of people coming. There's lots of people coming, and we're going to grow this economy, and we're going to make it great and all this. I'd like to know where he stands on that, and, and where does he stand on all the, the, you know, Halifax's position on the carbon? Uh, you know, it would be interesting to know. Is he, is he going to – so he was one way up there. Is he going to be the same when he's in Halifax? But, but my point was, you know, if he, he, he caused a lot of, the Trudeau government's caused a lot of hurt. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you can understand people being a little reluctant to vote for him now. Oh, I, well, I think so. But I, I think that the reason why I mentioned all of that stuff yesterday was to, you know, it seems to be the only reason why people are not considering Andy Fillmore as a candidate. And I'm not telling you who to vote for or anything along those lines, but you have to also look at what his what he wants to bring to the table here, right? 
So, yeah. you know, I think that in, or, in order to make an informed decision, yeah, you can ask him those questions, and I will. I'll, I will ask him those questions. Yeah. But, you know, you also have to look at what, what he's also saying that, you know, as mayor, his plan is. Yeah, but it's hard, it's hard to, to hire somebody to work for us. It's hard for me to hire him. Uh, if, if you slap somebody in the face one day, you know, it, it, it's, it's hard to come back from that. Fair enough. Rob, I appreciate the call. Okay, stay cool, Dan. You too. <laughs> 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000 is the number. Uh, boy, I'm getting lots of emails about the Leafs. I think maybe I opened up a can of worms there. Anyway, it just would be nice to see it once. And and I, I do, and I will suggest that, and I, I, of course, will ask that question of, of him when he's in here or when he's on the phone, uh, either or, uh, uh, what, you know, what he thinks about the carbon tax and what he thinks about immigration, because it impacts you and I and everybody else as, as a resident of HRM. But I, I will challenge you if, if you've already turned off your, the, 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 your thoughts of, of, and I, and I'm not an Andy Fillmore supporter by any means, but if just, you know, if that's the only reason why is because he was a member of, of the liberal party federally, is that, is that, and I don't know if the right word is fair. Should you not also look at, at what he says he's going to do here as as the mayor? Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe it's, it's that's enough. He just he he did what he was told in Ottawa, in Ottawa and didn't stand up to the prime minister and won't stand up for Halifax as the mayor. Maybe that's where you're at. I don't know. I'm not telling you how to vote, nor will I ever tell you how to vote. But that's just my thoughts on everything. We need to stop down and take another break. The midweek meltdown continues on the other side of it. You're listening to the Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand. We're back in minutes. Welcome back to the Tavino Show. Dan Allstrand along with you. Hope you're having a fantastic day. It's only a few hours away now. We're almost there. It's time for hockey to kick off in uh, earnest. And uh, I know our next uh, caller is pretty excited about the Toronto Maple Leafs this year, aren't you, Eric? Uh, not really. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. But I made a prediction a while back before Todd went into the hospital. I said that the Maple Leafs are going to win the Stanley Cup on their 60th anniversary of, since they won the last one. And that's not going to happen until 2027. Mm. And uh, Todd said, he started laughing. But anyway, I can't see them uh, going. I got my projections in in front of me, and I'm going to drop them off at the radio station, and sure. you can look them over. But I will make this prediction, and I'll leave, it, I'll leave, I'll leave the air on this. The Stanley Cup could happen again between the Oilers and Florida, and I'm picking the Oilers in five. And I will drop off my predictions, and you guys could ponder it, you and Mr. Bennett, and hopefully when Todd gets out, he can look it over. For sure. I'm a little bit worried about the baseball. The Yankees don't look very good. Um, well, there was a lot man, of talk that, 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 that they the were in tough in this terrible. series, right? There was There was a lot of people that were saying that, you know, this, this first-round series that the Yankees were going to be in tough, or the second-round series, the championship series. Yeah, and um, Mr. Wright, Cecil Wright, said that San Diego could be a surprise. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my hopes up that, you know, because I made a prediction that it's going to be, it should be, the Yankees and the Dodgers. But those two teams are in dire straits, and it could be a surprise this year. But I'll just see what happens, and uh, like I said, I'm going to drop off these predictions for hockey, and I got, I'm got doing my NBA right now, so I'll pass that on. But the NBA has 10 teams that make the playoffs, so anybody could win that. But Boston, I mean, as much as I hate to say it, Boston could repeat because they're just, uh, you know, loaded with talent. I'm talking about the Boston Celtics. Mm-hmm. But I'll let you get back to your work, Europe, Dan, and um, give, my, give my hopes and best of luck to Todd, and um, please hurry up and get back. We'll do that. Thanks, Eric. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. I know Todd uh, will be watching the hockey game tonight, as I will. Uh, infernal, infernal. Infernal, is that the word? Eternal. Uh, Maple Leaf fans, and uh, we both watch it with a critical eye <laughs> because I don't think either of us were alive when the last time the Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup. So, um, just one. 
That's just it. Just, just one. It's all I ask for. Welcome, Dave, to the program. Dave, how are you? Dan, I couldn't be better if I was you. There, well, I don't know, man. I'm having kind of a day. But anyway, what's on your mind today? Well, first of all, go Leafs, go. Oh, I boy. was alive all okay. through their Stanley Cup wins in the 60s. So, you know, being the eternal optimist, we're looking for the cup back. Well, let's hope. But what I want to yeah, what I wanted to call in on, and maybe you can educate me, I caught a bit on the radio this morning about a change in uh, how they handle foreign-trained doctors, mm-hmm. and they're changing the certification time from a year and a half to 90 days. Have I got that right? But I think there's a, and I'm just trying to find the story here, but I, I think that there's a there's a different method. It's not that, that they're going to just shorten the time. I think they're, there's a... A, a, a mechanism that they're using to to ensure that their training is up to snuff. I'm just trying to find the the piece here, but yeah, yeah here it is, right here. New medical program will certify internationally trained doctors more quickly to work in the province's health system. Premier said, starting next year, a new Halifax-based clinic will assess international medical graduates while providing primary care to 2,500 patients. Houston says the program will significantly cut the assessment time for per- prospective candidates to about 12 weeks from the current 18 months. Graduates of the program will receive a license to practice in Nova Scotia and will be required to sign a three-year service agreement to work in the province. He figures about 45 licenses a year will be issued through it compared to 39 that were issued over the last five years to internationally trained doctors. So you're right. Okay. Yeah, so I've got, I've got the basics right. You now, do. is this strictly a, pro- a provincial incentive? Yeah, I do believe. I think this is a Nova Scotia thing. Okay. All right. So, because I was going to say, if the municipalities are involved in any way, let's get away from the bike lane fantasy and funnel that money into into adding more of these people into the system. Right. Uh, because we have a demonstrated need, obviously, for more uh, medical personnel uh, right across the board. And you know, starting next year, unfortunately, it's a year too late. But yeah, I guess better late than now. I have to start somewhere, right? I guess I'd like to see it start tomorrow, but yeah, fair. now I have a I have a family doctor, so this doesn't affect me. I'm one of the lucky ones, but there's a lot of people out there that need this. Yep, I hear you. Well, there you go. That's my my speech for today, sir. And have a good one. A long weekend. I'll be happy to take the chair for you while you're gone. <laughs> All right, Dave. I'll keep it in mind. <laughs> have a good one. Nine zero two four zero five six thousand. That's nine zero two four zero five. 6,000. Uh, I don't know if you heard it. I got a couple of emails. Uh, if you heard me talking during, I think it was, uh, during Dr. John earlier today uh, about the, uh, the, the opening pleasant experience that I had, uh, out there shopping. For those of you that didn't, I was at, at a local grocery store last week sometime and I was waiting in, in line at the till and, uh, the, the checkout line behind me, there was an older gentleman, uh, that was trying to pay for, you know, a handful of, and it wasn't anything, it was sugar and flour and those kind of things. And he had a, a, like a really old from the, from the, looked like from the fifties, $50 bill that was in some bad disrepair. And the, 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 the store management wouldn't accept the bill. They said that he would have to go to the bank in order to, uh, to, to get that bill exchanged because of the condition it was in and, and, and so on and so forth. That being said, he said, well, look, that's all I have. Like, I can't pay for these things. I'll, I'll go to the bank. I'll put this stuff back. I'll go to the bank and, um, and come back with the money. And, and, uh, in the interim, the person behind them, uh, paid for the guy's groceries. And that just totally brought a smile to my face that there are, despite all of the things we talk about here on this program a lot. And, and as Todd says, and, and I agree that, uh, you know, people who are happy with things don't call open line radio, but, uh, it was just, it was, it was nice to see it made, it made uh, that person's day. And it made everybody that was standing around that little, uh, that area that saw that exchange, it made everybody smile and, and, uh, and bright their day. And it's, uh, it's all it takes. And, and I sign off every show by saying, being kind to one another. And that's all it takes. Right? Just thought I would share that with you. Carl, how are you? Very well. Yeah. I, might, <laughs> I tell you what, I, I second that motion. Oh my gosh. It doesn't right? take much. To just make someone smile, right? And that's all. And the, just think of the world if we did that once a day to somebody. How how different things oh, would be out there. It would be a great world to live in, right? right? Cool. What's on your mind? Well, my heart goes out to all the people who are getting hit by Florida. My younger oh. sister, uh, yeah, they're getting hit bad. This is going to be catastrophic. I mean, unbelievable. And um, 
But no, I, I second that motion. You know, we need more, uh, you know, more efforts to show our love to people in the community and, and just try and really, can we just all get along? Right. You know, you look what's going on in the Middle East and everything that's going on. It's an election year. Oh, my God. And uh, all business owners are very nervous about all these things because it affects us all. Right. Even, yeah, even in the States. I mean, it, it everything that happens down there affects us. And uh, so my heart really just goes out to those people. And, and guess what? Once it, tra- it travels across, we're going to have two hurricanes in the ocean, right, coming uh, somewhat our way. And, and it's going to throw big sw- swells here. I was going to say, I bet you're, you're champing at the bit to get out there and check those out. Yeah, we're going to see what happens, but it should be interesting for yeah. sure. Hey, thanks for taking my call, and you have a great day, Dan. Keep up the good work, and thanks, I hope Carl. Vanessa gets well soon. Cheers. 902-405-6000. That's 902-405-6000. Lots of open lines if you want to get in and do a quick hitter, as Ricky used to call them. The Midweek Meltdown continues after the break. You're listening to The Todd Vino Show. I'm Dan Allstrand. We're back in minutes. Thanks. So during the break, uh, having a conversation with uh, other fans of of the NHL in the newsroom and, and uh, hearing some early team reports uh, from Toronto, it's it's like you know it's like that. that I hate to use the word curse, but my goodness, uh, Joseph Wall, our starting goaltender, out with a lower body injury, so apparently not starting tonight. And uh, that means uh, that Mr. Stolantz, our backup that we got from Florida last year, is in. So we're already down a a, a starting goaltender. And the season hasn't started yet. Anyway, just one. That's all I want. Andrew, how are you? I'm doing fantastic, Dan. Happy to be on the radio. What's on your mind? Um, I just want to really stress how important it is um, that, A, people understand I am listening. I love this show, and not only do I listen to it to hear what's on everyone's mind, but I actually talk to the people. So if anyone out there has anything to say and they want to be heard, Andrew Goodsell is definitely the one for it. I really want to remind them that voting is super important. Um, And if you don't think that, you know, the people who you think are going to win are the people to vote for, then your vote going towards any other candidate, whether you think they're going to win or not, shows what you want in your future. Um, So look at their campaigns. Look at what they want to do for the people and place your vote. And you know what? Like you said, um, if you don't want to vote for anyone, well, mention that you don't want to vote for anyone. Um, I uh, I just want everyone to know that their, um, their opinion matters. We all matter. And if you guys don't think it matters, I just want to remind everyone, that it does because every vote that I see at the end of this is going to light up my world. Andrew, appreciate the call, sir. Much love. Have a great day. 902-405-6000. 902-405-6000. I said it yesterday and, uh, and uh, I will stick to what I said yesterday that if you really, and this, this at obviously we're in the midst of a, of a municipal election campaign but at all levels of government, you know, there's lots of talk that we're perhaps getting ready for a provincial election. We know that the liberal government in Ottawa is teetering on a knife's edge these days. Do you really want to shake up this establishment? Do you really want to tell Ottawa or province house or city hall what you think? Do you really want to scare those politicians? Vote. I will tell you that if you, we see a major increase in, in, in voter participation in any election, be it this city election or, or the province or, the, or at the federal level, that will scare the daylights out of politicians. Because as I said yesterday, they bank on 38, 40% support. They bank on us being apathetic. They bank on the limited number of votes that they need in order to be elected. You want to really put the system on its ear? Vote. Right, Rod? Yes. Yes, Dan, that is right. I believe I agree with everything you're saying there. you got to get out and vote. And the prime example of what happens when you don't 
is the first time Trump got elected. Everybody after that, there's all kinds of outcry about uh, people complaining about why he was in there, but no one really asking the true question, the hard question, that is, how many of those people who are complaining about Trump being in there actually voted? Right. If they all got out and voted, the amount of people that complained about Trump being in there, if they all got out and voted, then they would have maybe had a different result in the election. Not that I'm a, a pro-Trump thing or anything. That's just a prime example of why you should get out and vote. Don't need to complain afterwards. I mean, and if you, you get just, out your vote. If you go and, back and you look at the, the results from the last municipal election in HRM and you look at some of the races, particularly in those places where there wasn't an, an incumbent and, and it was there was five or six or eight or, or nine candidates vying for council, the, the difference between first place and third and fourth place isn't a lot of votes. And, and I will tell oh. you that, that politicians and those that, that work for politicians, that, that uh, are, are advisors and work on their campaigns, are banking on a low turnout. So let's scare the heck yeah, out of them and get out and vote. They get 38% supporters supporting their campaign. They almost know they're going to win. Right. Right. So why give it to them? Why get out and vote and and uh, shake things up a little bit? You want different people in? Get out and vote. And the other thing that they don't, that is true, but they don't necessarily put out, and they should, is how many spoiled ballots are in municipal elections. Elections in Nova Scotia, they count all those. They keep a record of them. They may not put it out for everyone to hear, but that's a more of a protest than not voting. Is right. if you go and you spoil your ballot, because you're telling them right there on a record that you didn't like none of the above candidates that you were voting for because you destroyed your ballot. But at least you went through the or process. ruined it or whatever. Yep. So they, they, they count all those spoiled ballots. They may not let that number out, but it's there for people to look up. And that's a protest right there, maybe a silent one, but it's one that goes on record and, and stuff. And the other thing I, sure, I have to mention to you, it's a different topic, but the uh, people, uh, the person that was on here the other day talking about the head of the Spring Garden Road Business Association saying that the Cogswell Street interchange wasn't affecting traffic, <laughs> that's a, not a real 100% accurate statement because for a person who drives in, Halifax every day. Any amount of road construction that's going on in Halifax affects your traffic flow, especially when you have Hollis Street being detoured for your access onto it, Barrington Street de- being detoured for your access on and off it to get there by the downtown core and the rest of Barrington Street. And then we have Bell Road, which is another way out. It, it When you start cutting arteries down, it does have a, a, an impact on traffic flow. And a very severe one by times. Rod, I appreciate the call. Thank you very much. 902-405-6000. A couple lines open if you want to get on quickly here. Before the top of the hour, got an email from Lee talking about uh, uh, voting. And he says, if we truly want a higher voter turnout, one simple way would be to add standalone issues to the ballot. One example would be bike lanes. Make it a standalone voting issue. I think he's talking about maybe a plebiscite or one of those questions. Councillors are clearly not listening to the voting public on issues like this. Maybe if an issue had 10,000 signatures on it, it could be added to a list during voting time. The results would then be binding. It works in other cities, and it could work here too. That from Lee. 902 405 6000. That's 902 405 6000. Lines are wide open if you want to get a quick hitter and get in and get out before uh, we end things here at 1 o'clock. Again, just a programming note today, uh, the Halifax Mooseheads, a rare Wednesday. They don't do these often anymore, but there's a rare Wednesday uh, game tonight, so if you're uh, looking for something to do or maybe you're going to watch the uh, the NHL kick off, the Canadian teams kick off in the NHL tonight, maybe you have that on the television and maybe have the Halifax Mooseheads game on the radio. We'll provide that for you, of course. That uh, happening uh, puck drops at 7 o'clock. Gareth uh, will call the action from Bathurst for you here on 95.7 News Radio as we do each and every game for the Halifax Mooseheads who are out, off to an outstanding start and uh, we hope that uh, their support continues to grow as uh, we move along. Also, a programming note, uh, the municipal election is is winding down. I know we've been talking about it a lot lately, but it's winding down. And on uh, the 19th of October, it is election day and we will bring you all the results right here at, at uh, 95.7 News Radio. As uh, those results come in, we'll get them out to you. That's uh, our promise to you. And there's a Moosehead Games that night as well, so we're working on a contingency plan to, to try and do both.
Technology is a wonderful thing when it works. Anyway, we will have an election show right here on the on uh, 95.7 News Radio and on our website, halifax.citynews.ca, and I hope that uh, you uh, join us uh, for that. Let's get a couple quick ones in here before we go. Tim, how are you? Hey, Dan. Uh, just my solution for the homeless. Like I, 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 I'd say the, the pallet shelters are a good idea, okay. but it's just, it's just where they go. And as far as for me, I think we should put them where it's conveniently convenient for us, the taxpayer people. So if you can find a place like out at Exhibition Park or uh, out at Bears Lake where they're putting in the new area out there, or even over Eastern Passage, some place where people can agree on and then give them bus service and uh, tell them, the, 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 the homeless people, this is where you can go, but you're not staying where you are. That's and, a fair and then point. You, can, you can provide a bus service for them to go, get back and right. forth Understood. To, yep. to, the, to the city. But uh, and, and then even on top of that, the places right now where that they're going to put the the pallet pallet homes or whatever that that, that that's a, like expensive areas. You could even put aside the money that they would get for the sale of the uh, of the area, the money that they would get for uh, that that they would collect from the property taxes, and maybe p- pay for that for homeless needs in the future. But. Um, as far as putting them, I definitely wouldn't want them in my backyard, and I don't think they're putting them in any place that they that they should. So put put them where people can agree on, and it doesn't matter if they agree on. It's what what we would agree on is they're not going to stay where they are. Tim, I appreciate the call nine zero two four zero five six thousand. The only problem with that is is that if they're um, if they're a long way out of town or they're uh, or the the bus is only a couple times a day because they're in places like Exhibition Park. Then convincing people to 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 go there and not to to stay uh, in an encampment or in wherever that they're staying now is is going to be the the bigger task. It's a tough tough question. I get it. I don't think there's anybody that's going to call up the program and say I want to have forty shelters in my behind my fence in my backyard. I, re- I really don't think there is anybody. But if if Maybe maybe Tim's right. Maybe we're we're approaching it wrong. Maybe we need to to look at at different uh, different solutions. And 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 part of the the site selection process is to um is to you know wrap around services and transport and transport lakes and those kind of things. Maybe we maybe we build the the sites and then bring those those links to the sites. Maybe that's an approach. Natalie, you get the last word today. Okay, thanks. I was just calling because I'm just piggybacking on a uh, topic from yesterday, like pretty much what some people are saying today, too, but the elections. I was just saying that, I uh, just wanted to say that we, my spouse and I went for a drive on Sunday. We were doing errands, but we decided to cross a few, few neighborhoods and whatever, and then we're seeing all these signs, and we're just kind of talking about the election. And we have an incumbent and somebody else that's running. Um, anyway, I'm not going to say who, but anyway, we were just kind of thinking, like, you know, we were kind of like, we're not really having anything to complain about, but we decided to check out, you know, how, you know, you should look at the website. So we checked out the people and, um, you know, just, there was some just kind of word salad in some of these profile things <laughs> that just yep. didn't seem very direct. So we thought, do you know what? I think, you know, we've been really kind of no complaints with the incumbent. So we voted yesterday when we both did the same thing. We voted for our incumbent and we voted for Jim Hoskins. Natalie, appreciate the call. Have a good one. Thanks, you too. That's going to do it. Thanks to everyone that picked up the phone, dialed the numbers, and joined the show. You make my day every day you do it. Have a fantastic day, everyone. And remember, be kind to one another.